Some of the most amazing and terrifying images of hell from the Middle Ages are found in a 15th century manual describing the apocalypse, the end of the world. Produced by Carthusian monks in France, known as Le Livre de la Vigne de Notre Seigneur, or The Book of the Vineyard of Our Lord. Named after the parable of the laborers in the vineyard, from the opening of the Gospel of Matthew, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. It contains 83 miniatures, many of which picture the torments of hell in vivid and lurid detail. It describes the events which Christians believed would take place at the end of the world. Written in French prose with many Latin quotations from the Bible and the Church Fathers. Most of the pages are just text, but I'll be focusing mainly on the art in the illustrations. I have also linked below in the description the full English translation of the text. This seems to have been the second volume of a larger two-part work, completed sometime before 1463 in France. Book One is a treatise on the Incarnation, Passion, and Resurrection of Christ. The author refers to the first part as the Traité de la Passion. In fact, it's a much broader anthology intended to support the good practice of the Christian religion, the labor of man in the Lord's vineyard. The second part, which is this one, is largely a compendium of information and moral teachings about hell that focuses on five topics. The Antichrist and his war on the Church, the Fifteen Signs Before the Last Judgment, the Last Judgment, the Torments of Hell and the Sufferings of the Damned, and the Bliss of Heaven or Paradise. The author explains in great detail the punishments for cardinal sins, torments for specific groups of damned souls, and detailed descriptions of Lucifer and the devils, who administer divine judgment. This imagery isn't surprising as both death and hell are pictured as living monsters in the Bible and in subsequent Christian imagery. Made in southeastern France around 1460, its author and illustrators are unknown. It's thought to be Carthusian because one illustration depicts two Carthusian monks. This seems to be the only surviving copy of the text. There are corrections and insertions by the original scribe on almost every page, which makes it seem like the scribe and the author may have been one and the same person who may have been a monk of the Grand Chartreuse, the mother house of the Carthusian order of monks. Although the text may have been composed and written out in a monastery, the manuscript's illumination is unquestionably the work of several professional painters, including one of exceptional talent who painted three miniatures of the celestial court with Christ or the Virgin at the center all with brilliant blue backgrounds. The book was probably intended for reading and viewing by a layperson, who would have approached the imagery as a focus of devotion. In the 18th century, the manuscript was owned by a French collector and then passed through the collections of three others before being acquired in 1823 by collector and antiquary Francis Douce at a Paris auction. He bequeathed it to the Bodleian Library on his death in 1834. The first section of the manuscript is devoted primarily to the Antichrist and his activities.
medieval Christians developed the belief that the Antichrist, a human incarnation of evil, would appear before the Last Judgment to deceive Christians. The Book of the Vineyard describes him as both man and devil. In the manuscript, he is pictured as a well-dressed young man with two heads, one atop the other. The second head is that of a red-horned devil, symbolizing that the devil has entered the body of the fair youth. The book then portrays this creature in the different stages of his career as he seduces the world and turns the populations of earth against the Christian church. Interestingly, written a hundred years before the Reformation by Catholic monks, the Antichrist is depicted here arriving in Jerusalem as a false pope. The persecution of the church begins, true followers of Christ and anti-followers of the Antichrist. The Antichrist is here being zapped by God while the devil takes his soul. This first section also includes a description of the 15 signs of the coming judgment, each arriving one day after the next. After the destruction of the Antichrist comes the end of the world itself. First, however, the population of Earth have to endure fifteen signs of the end, each of them terrible enough in themselves. This is a very densely illustrated portion of the manuscript, with a large miniature for each sign, which often elaborate upon the text. For example, the text reports that animals refuse to eat and drink on the fifth day. The painter emphasized the agony of the animals in that miniature by showing the bear, stag, and lion with lolling tongues, clearly suffering from thirst. First sign. Sea rises above the mountains. Second sign. Sea descends out of sight. Third sign. Gathering of fish and sea monsters. Fourth sign burning of the waters. Fifth sign, plants sweat blood. Sixth sign, buildings and towns fall. Seventh sign, the stones fight with each other. Eighth sign, earthquakes. Ninth sign, the earth made flat. Tenth sign, the people emerge speechless from their hiding places. Eleventh sign, the dead rise from their tombs. Twelfth sign, the stars fall. Thirteenth sign, the living die so that they may rise again with the dead. Fourteenth sign, Earth and sky consumed by fire. Fifteenth sign, sun and moon await his coming. Next, of course, comes the end and the great final judgment. After the world is flattened, the angels blow their trumpets and all the dead are raised together to face judgment. This is depicted rather wonderfully as both the opening of the tombs and the emptying of death pictured as the mouth of the Leviathan, the great biblical sea monster. Christ appears in the sky, attended by angels, to judge and separate the blessed and the damned. Angels bearing the symbols of his passion attend him, while leaders of the church watch on with approval. As the women and the apostles pray for the souls of the dead, Christ judges them. The right arm is raised in blessing, the left stretched out in condemnation. Jesus, perched on a rainbow, prepares to sentence the damned, among whom, it appears, are a pope and a king. But of course the judging must be fair and according to an official standard, so scales are employed, and Michael, the chief angel, is given the job of weighing the souls. The idea of the weighing of the souls is not found in the New Testament, but it was an idea taken over by the Church from Egyptian mythology. 
It became a stock feature of medieval and Renaissance depictions of the Last Judgment. However, Christ does not judge alone. After all, he promised the twelve apostles that they would rule with him. So at the Last Judgment, they will sit in judgment with him like a celestial twelve-man jury. With the words, Depart from me, accursed ones, into everlasting fire, Christ banishes the damned from his presence. And so the Antichrist has been defeated, the end of the world has come, and the dead have been raised, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting damnation. For the monks reading this amazing book, the text and these marvelous illustrations would have both terrified them and reassured them. The various wars and rumors of wars, plagues, famines, and earthquakes that they experienced and knew of, and the failures of popes, priests, kings, and emperors, could all be read not as random chaotic events without meaning, but as signs of the end, which the book told them was in the hands of Jesus, their Lord. They could find some comfort and hope in that. But this isn't the end of the book. It goes on to describe in graphic detail the horrors awaiting those who are sentenced to perdition. Next, the damned are sent down to hell through what appears to be a giant mouth-shaped hole in the ground. The damned are accompanied by the demons who will torment them for the rest of eternity, who seem very excited for it. The crowded feeling of bodies and the confusion of orientation symbolizes the chaotic nature of life without God. Here is a close-up of the hell's mouth, and we can see some of the beasts and monsters who will be tormenting the damned. This is clearly by a different illustrator. First, it seems, the damned who broke the commandments are cooked in ovens. Having been cooked, the damned are now ready for their punishment. Those guilty of the seven deadly sins are punished in such a way that each punishment reflects in some way the nature of the sin. Here the proud and vainglorious, those who think too much of themselves, are broken on a terrible wheel. After they're done, standing tall and proud will be impossible, as it requires a strong backbone. Here, those guilty of envy are being immersed in either fire or ice, no doubt thinking that the other group have it easier. Here, the wrathful are being punished by experiencing the rage and aggression of the devils. Below, the slothful are being eaten by dragons and eagles. The wrathful and the slothful are close to each other for a reason. Sloth was considered to be closely connected to wrath. St. Bonaventure wrote, Wrath, when it cannot avenge itself, turns sullen, and thus from it is born sloth. And Brunetto Latini, Dante's guardian and teacher, wrote, In wrath, neglectful sloth is born and abides. Sloth was wrath turned in on itself. These are not people who just don't like hard work. These are people who bitterly resent having to do anything because they're angry all the time, an anger turned inwards in sullenness and gloom. Here are the avaricious being cooked. Interesting to see popes, bishops, and kings in there. Next is gluttony. Here they're being punished by being forced to sit around a meal table but there's nothing palatable to eat there. In the medieval era, gluttony was considered a worse sin than lust because it was thought that for the glutton, food takes the place of God, and it was in fact a form of idolatry. The classification of gluttony as a greater evil than lust is reflected in a widespread medieval interpretation of a section in Genesis, according to which Adam's sin was literally an excessive love of food. Since the food was offered to Adam by Eve, 
Gluttony also had sexual implications and was seen partly as the root cause of lust. So lust and gluttony were thought to be interconnected, the one led to the other. Perhaps for that reason medieval spirituality emphasized fasting as a means to purge the soul. And here are the lustful being cooked together. Just as they burned for one another while they were alive, so they will burn with one another in this way in hell. Some other sins depicted beyond the typical seven, such as thieves, murderers, and tyrants, are also punished. They experience violence and tyranny themselves. Finally, these images were added to remind the reader that being in hell is a terrible way to spend your eternity. Fire was generally the most popular image of eternal torment. This is in the mouth of hell. And here the damned writhe in the flames of hell. Being eaten seems to have also been a very popular imagined fate. Here the damned are eaten by worms. The reference to worms is found in the Bible and becomes one of the main images of hellish torment in medieval art. Here the damned are devoured by wild creatures and snakes. We usually think of hell as hot and fiery, but in some depictions, freezing is an option too. Hell can be icy cold as well. Here we see the damned frozen or encased in ice. The bottom circle of hell is a profoundly cold and silent place. This shouldn't surprise us when we realize that God was usually thought of as pure light. People knew that the sun, the source of their light, was also the source of warmth, and could readily have understood the image of somewhere far away from God being dark and cold. The bottom of hell is as far away from God as you can get. And finally, some poor souls are being fed molten metal. Although much less exciting, this book also features beautiful images of heaven. I hope you found this topic as interesting as I did. Please remember to like and subscribe and leave a comment below 